podcast time today on rambling about cars it's time to get our game on we're going gaming we're talking car games video games cars video games they go together like peanut butter and jelly we're going to take a little look back at at the old times and then we're going to jump forward into sim racing because sim racing is big big deal these days and then just for the fun of it we're going to launch a new segment called unsung heroes where we're picking cars that don't get the respect they deserve friends ladies and gentlemen knights of nitro rambling about cars i'm christopher smith across the screen co-host chris bruce how you going I'm doing, fan, I'm doing great. Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about car video games and then cars that deserve more attention. But right now, I want to uh, introduce our guest for this week, and that's Matt Crisera. Um, he is also one of our writers at Motor One. He writes fantastic news, just like the Chris's and I, or just like Chris and I. Just like the Chris's. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, yeah, so Matt, thanks for being on the show. And since you are our first guest since John Neff, you have to go through our questionnaire. So <laughs> Big before, you, before you do that, do you have anything you want to say? Uh, no, just thanks for having me on, guys. This, this will be fun. Sure. Looking, so. looking forward to it. And, and we should also point out, Matt's also a big gamer. Um, I, I do a lot of the console stuff. Matt does a lot of the PC side. So, yeah, we're going to have a good conversation today. Oh, we're, we're so getting our nerd on right now. <laughs> so to start, Matt, what is your favorite car of the 1980s? Ooh, 80s. That's a tough one. Uh, I would say the Lamborghini Countach. Okay. Even kind of goes back to the 70s a little bit. But yeah. Ridiculous it was. Yeah. You know, uh, rear wing is an option. It was mm-hmm. theoretically illegal, but they, you know, in the parking lot when you would get one, they would, you know, screw it on with a power drill, drive off. <laughs> Love it. Sure. <laughs> that or the Testarossa, honestly. Yeah. Cool. No, that those are both very iconic 80s cars. What is your favorite car of the 1990s? Uh, 90s. I, I got to say the Volvo 850R. Okay. Wow. You know, okay. <laughs> that's that's an applause. That's some applause right there. <laughs> I think it was just ridiculous seeing it in the British Touring Car Championship. So you're talking the no, wagon version? In that the case. wagon version. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes. It's next to everything else. Just wicked. Got to go with that one approved yeah, let me totally. jump in let me jump in with a quick question Go since for we're it. still sick with cars what's your favorite rally car because you're kind of a rally guy aren't you Ooh. oh here we go easy, easy answer would be audi quattro but i gotta go uh lift the lancia 037 oh, oh look, just because okay. that's one of the best you know david and goliath stories of rallying you know last more applause last rear wheel drive car to win the world rally championship this I got to go with that one. <laughs> That's a good pick. I can't fight you there. Your favorite car movie. Uh, favorite car movie. Since I, I'm a big racing buff, so I, I got to go with uh, Rush. It's about okay. the, um, you know, James Hunt, Nicky yeah. Lauda. They're, uh, they're sort of dual. Mm-hmm. That's a good movie. That is a good movie. I can't. It, for anybody that hasn't seen it, it, it is just a fantastic movie. Yep, and we covered that quite a bit when it was in production here. Like, you know, they actually filmed at the Nurburgring, and some people kind of snuck in and filmed mm. that stuff. That was that was pretty cool. So, pick one: heated seats or heated steering wheel. Ooh, I've I've never had a heated steering wheel. That would be awesome, but I got to go with heated seats. Fair. I also have never had a heated steering wheel, so I'm with you. <laughs> I I have I've had both. I take the seats. Honestly, it's it's nice to, to grab onto a warm wheel, but put on some gloves, you slacker, you know? Some gloves. There you go. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> so I'm going to throw in a quick audible here before our last question, because I was actually... So with uh, Neff, we knew what he had. What car do you own right now? Uh, Volkswagen Golf GTI. Oh, what year? It's uh, Mark 7. Okay. Cool. The answer is always GTI. <laughs> so yes. the, the it's answer a manual. Is always, yeah. <laughs> oh, very good. And final question. Assuming it was available in the market right now, would you buy a level five autonomous vehicle? Which means that there are no physical controls. You just bloopity bloop where you want to go and it takes you there. And that would be your main more mode of transport. I, I would say no. Um, Definitely based off of the answer to the previous question, 
I just, I, I love driving too much, you know, to give it up. <laughs> Even if I could have a weekend car, I, I think I would still, uh, still stick with the uh, analog. Fair. Totally fair. No, fair, acceptable. <laughs> yeah, those honor. are all good answers. I can't fight. <laughs> I feel like that's the obligatory <laughs> answer, though, writing for a for a car site, right? Well, I, <laughs> I mean, mean, John was will. It, the level five was is what put him off. It had been level four, and you still had steering wheel and pedals. He was fine with it. The, yeah, for sure. I, I think um, on like long haul car journeys, if if I was like on the highway and then it would take over, I would do that you know, just for sort of the mm -hmm. sort of the really long stuff. But um, if I didn't have the option, I, I got to say no. <laughs> well, totally I mean, fair. I just think of I think of all the commutes when I was living in Michigan that I did from Ann Arbor to Dearborn when I was at Ford. It didn't it didn't matter what car I had. That commute sucked. So mm -hmm. give me a level five. Just just take me to work. I don't care to drive on I-94. I hate I-94. Yeah, and then I mean, I'll get and then I'll get home and I'll take out the analog car for some fun. Can you imagine the people in, you know, 20, 30 years that are just going to be sleeping? Like you just wake up, you <laughs> 20, go back to 20, bed in your years. car. If that happens now, man, don't you see YouTube at all? I, but that's, <laughs> those people are going to die. <laughs> well, you didn't say that part. That, that's true. We got some games to talk about. We do. We do. We do have some games to talk about. So this all started, we were talking about sim racing because Matt, you and Chris are both way more into sim racing. I... I dabble in it. I've been way into it in the past. And just because of my current setup, I'm not so much now. So that's kind of what we wanted to talk about. But the thing is, when you talk about sim racing, you kind of want to talk about where it came from. And the interesting thing is, is that sim racing is a bit more modern than you think, because the computing power didn't exist for, you know, a a lot of the 80s, really. It's kind of the very late 80s that you get your first sim sim racers. Um, so, but before that, you know, in the arcade, you kind of got things that weren't quite there. So you got your your pole positions. Uh, you guys play pole position? Oh, not only did I play pole position, I've got to, uh, let, me, let me bring this up here. Pole position, I mean, that goes back to what? We're talking... I believe that's an 86, but I will look it up while you're talking about it. No, no, actually, I, I think it was I think it was earlier. Um, yeah, according to this, 1982. No and here's, way. And here's the thing with pole position. You're right, 82. I, I mean, we're, we're looking at this here. Uh, for those listening, if you get us on YouTube, you can see what we're talking about here. Not only was pole position just kind of this cool game with, you know, a Formula One car... They had actual tracks. I mean, this is Fuji well, they had Speedway. A actual track. They had, there, there was an actual track. <laughs> the but the yes. sequel, I believe, had additional. Right. The sequel tracks. is where they started adding more tracks. You're and right. I mean, I, this is this is early '80s. The the graphics aren't the greatest. There's there's no way you could tell you were on Fuji Speedway. Uh, but you know, hey, you've got the big straight, then you've got the big corner down here at the end. I mean. I remember because because I'm sadly old enough to remember when I would go on family vacations and we stopped at like truck stops or wherever. I had to go look for this game to see if it was there because it was the stand up arcade box with the wheel, the gas and the brake. And if it was there, I was playing it. I had to play it. I mean, in my opinion, this is where it all begins. Pole position, early 1980s. Everything that we're doing right now, whether it's Gran Turismo or Forza on consoles, whether it's iRacing, um, all, all the virtual stuff, the virtual races that are being done right now, this is, I mean, this is where it all begins right here. And Hope that's a good point because it, the other thing is, is that, like I said, I thought this was much later. 82, your standard home computer could do nothing like this. Like, you know, Maybe if you were a Steve Jobs, like something like that, you could. But for the average person, the average home computer, I mean, at that point, the, your Atari 2600, you know, the Inten Nintendo Entertainment System didn't, it, its soft launch was an 85, its real launch was an 86. So 82, that kind of is your sim racing because there is nothing else. Well, and and I mean, it, obviously, you're not networked together. No, um, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember. I don't think there was ever a pole position sequel where you could race against another 
live person like 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 you got with like like daytona usa and 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 those other cabinets you know so as far as it, i believe there was but it was much later namco right. did another formula one game like they kind of kept iterating on it but i want to say it was in the 90s um like very early 90s before you could do that like it was a while if though you wanted to race against someone else and still we're not really talking about <laughs> sims you had to go with your Ivan Iron Man Stewart super off road. Oh, and I loved this. I love I, I I still love this. There's an arcade bar here in Rapid City that uh that has Ivan Stewart super off road that I still visit from time to time when uh, when COVID situations allow. Sure. Matt, have you played this one? I, I have not. Oh, you're we're, really we're, like, we're like 20 this years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it still predates me a little bit. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. It's just so here's what you are playing with another person. So on this cabinet, there are four steering wheels and pedal sets right next to each other. Yeah, I mean, you're playing with four people. Yeah, it's not just two player. Or, you know, you could play two, but if it, yeah. you know, I had one of these in my college, uh, in the laundromat of my college dorm. Oh, man. <laughs> and so, you know, you're waiting for your underwear to dry and like you throw then, in some extra quarters and, and then you blow you all go. your quarters on this. And now you got to hang your underwear <laughs> out the window. Exactly. Guilty. Yeah. Like, you know, it, and again, so this is even simpler. This is a single screen game, but the competition is still there. You And the cool thing is you are elbow to elbow with the person you're playing against. Like you can kind of push, you know. You can push it around oh, yeah, with the guy. Yeah, it's still- <laughs> and it's again, it's not a sim experience, but it is a it, you know, you really get into the game, and that that's kind of what makes it cool. You get into it, and I mean, like pole position, that that was the foundation for other things to come. And I just gotta say, on on Ivan Stewart, super off road, it had the wheel, it had a, it had a shifter. Didn't it? If I remember, Ivan Stewart didn't. I don't think it didn't. It didn't have. Maybe okay. Maybe mm. you're right. But the wheel pole position I mean, did. Yeah, pole position. But it had high, high, and, low. high and low. Right. Yeah. The wheel on Ivan Stewart super off road. Yeah. This I mean, the- it, it it didn't have like stops or anything. It was just like it was just like a free wheel <laughs> thing. Right. So you, you just kind of you just you just put just all your body around. weight into it and stopped it at the right point. It was. And he, and you had nitro buttons, so if you yep. were like way behind on the last lap, all you were doing was just spinning the wheel and just <laughs> nailing the nitro buttons. And it kind of predates um, like uh, phone games today because if you put money in, you could buy more nitro. So like Ooh. if you really <laughs> wanted to beat that guy next to you, you could just throw some more quarters in and you just <laughs> sl- keep slapping the nitro button. So. That's pretty good. That's a, that's also sort of where that pay to win strategy came in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In a certain way, like they, they, yeah, they predated that. That's pretty good. So, so Matt, I mean, I mean, where does your, where does your kind of arcade sim racing experience begin? Uh, to be honest, it, it's pretty modern. Actually. I, I can't completely remember where exactly my interest in sim racing came from. I, I think what got me into sort of the the serious part of it was uh, Project Cars, okay. which you know started with a gamepad, and you know you you play with play with some buddies, and you know that was that was fun. It was a good balance. Um, and then you know I, I got into games like Assetto Corsa, and now Assetto Corsa Competizione, and it's a whole you know a whole another deal. But um, you know, actually, to be honest, I think it was uh, Dirt Three where everything started. And I was actually, okay. I, I started playing on a keyboard with that. Wow. Which I don't even know how <laughs> I made that work. But uh, yeah, I think Dirt 3 is where it all started. <laughs> I, I have good memories of Dirt 3. I mean, I thought, well, I guess before I get to Dirt 3, I have to think about, um, you know, the Gran Turismo series because I, I was, I think it was GT2. Yeah, that introduced that, the that, rally. That, that introduced rally. And that's really where I started to get my first kind of taste. I mean, I was in college at that point. Um, and that's where I started to get kind of my first taste of this whole rally scene. Right. And, so I, for and me, I, it was Colin McRae 2.0. Well, well, th- well, that, that too, Colin McRae, 
did Cal- was Colin McRae before Gran Turismo? I, I thought they were about the same time. They're very close. I'm going to look it up while we're talking here, but they're very Because I remember, close. I mean, my my first cockpit that I built, um, I mean, it's just a couple pieces of wood with a steering wheel sitting on it. But I was using that, if I remember correctly, for Colin McRae 2.0. And then I was using that for GT2. Of course, this was all on the PlayStation. I only recently got rid of my Colin McRae 2.0 game like a money. You sell it for kind of a pretty penny. Well, yeah, you know, I I thought I don't really play it. I mean, I like having it just for sentimental value, but I don't really play it. And uh, I was looking on eBay, and I mean, that's a popular game, and there's a following. So, uh, you know, what did I get? I think like forty bucks or so for it. So I just looked it up. Colin McRae 2.0 came out in. Uh, 2000 and 2000 yeah 2000 and gran turismo 2 came out 99 in japan but 2000 in the u.s okay yeah so so they were kind of right there yeah they're right there that really introduced me to rally because i didn't really know that much about rally up to that point um basically the same way that that's kind of the game that did it for me and and i think a lot of people are that way um especially in the states where nobody ever really knew it. it wasn't on tv Right. I like, mean, nobody really knew uh-huh. what what stage rally was. And that actually got me motivated with some friends of mine to uh, to attend the back then. It was part of the SECA, the Sports Car Club of America. Uh, the first snow drift event, you know, was a, a stage rally event in snow up in Michigan. I went oh, to is that. It Michigan, think, it's in Pennsylvania now, right? I think. No, no, it's still it's still in northern lower Michigan. OK, for some um, reason, I thought part of part Pennsylvania. of the ARA now, but. I went to to my first stage rally event that was, I think, 2000 or 2001 because of Gran Turismo, because of Colin McRae Rally 2.0. And I wonder how many people out there discovered this whole new genre because of video games. And, I think and that's actually you know? happened a lot. Like you think about the you know in gran turismo kind of the first car anyone was able to afford there was the corolla ae86 because it was it was like the entry level (laughs) car so people put so many hours into that i honestly wonder how much that popularity forced toyota and subaru to come out with the gt86 frs brz whatever you want to call them um you know about a decade or so after that that there was kind of that groundswell of interest I mean, it's it's amazing to see how it all evolved from early on to where it is now, not just in terms of the entertainment value, but a business case. I mm-hmm. mean, I mean, Matt, you know a lot more about the, I mean, the, the the hardcore sim racing genre than I do. I mean, there are professional sim racers. Sure. And. Some of no, them make sure, yeah. really some of them make really good money. Hey Ma, remember when you said, Oh, you, you're just gonna play <laughs> video games? That's you're not never gonna get anywhere in life. Oh, well, guess what? You know, it's like it's all morphed into just a huge bits and also a huge marketing opportunity for manufacturers. Do you remember um the grief that Toyota was getting for not having any cars in Forza Horizon? Mm-hmm. And I think even in a more modern standpoint, Nissan has had their GT Academy, which has put, uh, you know, gamers into race cars. It's, it's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a buzz phrase, but, um, you know, McLaren's gotten into it now with world's fastest gamer. And uh, it's really pretty cool. I mean, this guy, James Baldwin, who just won it, um, you know, he went from playing, you know, playing Sims and now he races a McLaren 720S GT3 in the, uh, you know, British GT3 championship with uh, Jensen Button's team. So it's like, you know, that's just nuts. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it really is. And it's, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of struggling for words right now because I'm still just kind of flabbergasted by the notion that games have come this far and it's at such a level of intensity really that it is right now. Matt, uh, have you, have you done anything with like iRacing? Uh, yeah, I, I had a little stint with iRacing with, you know, like cut okay. me out and a lot of that, but I, I, I didn't get too deep into it. Cause, cause I, I haven't had a chance to try iRacing yet. Listeners out there. If, if you can get us on Spotify, if you're listening to us on Google, Apple, YouTube, um, 
if you've done iRacing, shoot us a message. You know, I, I would, we're going to revisit games here in the future. Oh, it's, of course. It's one of those, it's one of those topics where it's, it's just way too big to talk about in a half hour. But uh, I mean, I would love to hear and have some conversations with some of the iRacing people. Um, I remember in my former mm-hmm. life in marketing uh, with a wood chipper company, I was actually contacted by somebody the, that was doing, you know, the professional stuff in iRacing asking if he could use if he could model a car based on our company because we we were sponsoring a car a nascar in the uh uh well, what was it the not the xfinity Arctica? series oh no it, it was oh it was nationwide back then nationwide, that's right okay mm. um we had a car the nationwide and, and it was just like okay well the, there are legit marketing opportunities here now Sure. You know, and that's um, pretty awesome. And it, to, to your point um, with with COVID and everything, when that, when that was sort of in its infancy, I thought it was cool how the Cup Series. Um, well, I think, yeah, it was iRacing. They sort of came back virtually through iRacing and these virtual events that they held. And it was really cool because it brought back guys like, you know, Dale Jr., Bobby Labonte yeah. and a whole bunch of other retired NASCAR drivers. I, even Jeff Gordon at one point, which is pretty cool. And just to this point, to this day, I think it was just, it was amazing to see racing come back in that way and just sim racing be thrown into this spotlight where everybody sees it. And I, I think it's still, it's still sort of in that spot. It hasn't really, uh, has, yeah, it hasn't really faded at all since then. I mean, well, even you- our company, you know, Motorsport, we kind of had, we, we helped sponsor the virtual 24 hours of Le Mans, which is, very mm. much in that, you know, yeah, that, d- that, done through motorsport games. I mean, there's yeah. we're all under the same umbrella motor one.com, uh, motorsport, motorsport, Network, motorsport, motor, motorsport <laughs> games. Um, yeah, I mean, this year the, the virtual 24 was, if I remember correctly, it was a huge thing. I mean, we've got it up here. Um, on the screen for YouTube right now, uh, we're helping put on the virtual 24 hour of, of Le Mans. I believe at the time it was the most watched virtual race in history. It it was. I, yeah, it, it was at that. And, um, you know, when you I, I watched part of it, I didn't watch all of it just because I, it's 24 I hours long. 24 I, hours. I, I can't sit still for 24 hours. <laughs> but I mean, from a spectator standpoint, no, you're not there. You're not you're not smelling the racing fuel. You're not, you're not hearing the sounds, but from honestly, from a television perspective, I didn't think it was really that different. And the racing action was still pretty competitive. Oh yeah. Every now and again, you would get, you you would get, you know, you'd get noticeable glitches in the game where, okay, well, that, that shouldn't have happened, but Hey, you know what? There are, there are real world glitches too. Mm -hmm. This this is just a, a, a different kind of a, a different kind of thing. Right. Yeah, and to, to your court about the racing, um, I, I think we have a clip here with uh, Gran Turismo in it, and it's a fallacy of sim racing is that you know, oh, it's it's just a game, it's you know, it's it's fake, but it actually produces some fantastic racing. You know, this this whole this whole notion that it's just sort of you know a game, people are starting to realize that it's it's just so much more. You know, I've I've had some conversations with some people that still. They they don't get that condescending, but I see it a lot from from people that do a lot of say autocrossing or uh, or just you know track day events. You know they're like, well, if you're going to spend that much money, why not spend it on a real car? And mm-hmm. to to be fair on all sides, because because I I've done a lot of autocross, I've done track days. It it's not the same as sitting in your home. And even even with a nice racing cockpit, it's still a different feel. It's still a different type of excitement. It's a different type of enjoyment. You can't really compare a, a sim racing genre versus a real racing genre. You really have to think of them as separately. But here's where sim racing really comes into its own. As somebody uh-huh. who enjoys driving, as somebody who enjoys pushing racing on the edge, I can get in 2021 a very satisfying racing experience with a good sim racing platform with a good wheel, with a good cockpit. And I don't even have a good wheel and a good cockpit yet. My stuff is all right, but I can get an experience that is satisfying enough 
to where I'm green at the end of the day. And I get excited if I cut a half a second off a lap time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that's where the sim racing genre is right now. And I think it's going to, it's only going to continue to get better. And I'm excited to see it being taken seriously. I'm excited to see, I mean, careers being made from this. It's a, it's a different approach to racing, but it is still real racing. I mean, am I, am I crazy? Mm -hmm. No, because it's still about the competition of who can go the fastest in, you know, around a specific course. No, I mean, if you, you jump into like a, uh, I mean, you jump into like Forza 7 online, you know, one of their online but, routes, and, and, and people are just uh, kind of plowing into each other. But Matt, I mean, like like you're racing on a set of course, uh, Competizione, right? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's probably my most played. Now, now, I mean, because I, I haven't, I haven't tried that online yet. No, I haven't either. What's, I mean, I mean, what's the, I mean, people take that seriously to a, to a degree where, I mean, the, they'll get like angry if you accidentally bump somebody. Never mind mm -hmm. trying to, you know, just full throttle into a corner to punt them into the end zone. You know, for sure. Yeah, I, it's funny. Um, except I've heard real racing drivers talk about. Uh, when they're going through this iRacing stuff and um, well, it said, of course, the competizione, they, um, the SRO sort of the governing body for uh, GT racing, which is what that game is all about. Um, they hosted a whole virtual series with real racing drivers. And a lot of them have said that it's actually more intense to race virtually because there's none of this sort of, uh, well, if you're in a real race car and you know, you're going, you know, 190, 100, miles an hour through Eau Rouge or something. There's sort of a fear factor there that if it goes wrong, you know, you will be injured. But um, if, if, you know, if you're in a set of course of competizione and you go for that really bold move and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go right, you, you know, you'll crash, but you have a reset button. So and you're still I think alive. we've seen it. Yes. Yeah, so that, that, that's a, you know, that's a good thing as well, but uh, it produces this really, amazing and exciting racing that I don't think you would see in real life. No, you, you're absolutely right there. You're absolutely right. You'll try things on the sim that you wouldn't try in real life. And yeah, that can, that can result in some, you know, holy crap. Did he really <laughs> just make that? Did he, did he really just pull off that pass? And for uh, sure. And if, he, it, and if he doesn't, well, yeah, you know that too, right? <laughs> it's honestly been weird <laughs> as well, because I've had, uh, you know, I've had super serious races and, um, you know, I compete in some league competition. It's, it's no, nothing big, but you know, you'll have like a really intense race and I'll be done. And I'm like, wow, my heart is like racing right now. And I'm, I'm just sitting in front of a, you know, front of a desk with wheels and pedals in front of me. It's, um, it's, it's really cool what it does. So Matt, can I, can I ask you, um, tell us about your rig. What are you, what are you racing with right now? Oh yeah, definitely. So yeah, um, I have a Thrustmaster TSPC racer. It's sort of like a formula style wheel. Mm -hmm. um, that and the uh, Thrustmaster pedals to go with it. I, I forget exactly what they're called, but um, you know, it's strapped to a desk. I, I don't have a proper, you know, rig per se. Uh, but I think it's proof enough that you don't need, you know, you don't need a direct drive wheel or, you know, these load cell pedals and, you know, fan attack <laughs> stuff to be really fast. Um, you know, r really even on a game pad, you can be, um, you can be quick, but uh, yeah, that's what I'm working with right now. And, and just to be clear, you're, you're running through a PC, right? You're, you're not, do, do you do anything with consoles? Uh, just PC right now. Okay. I know I'm, I'm part of a Facebook group, a, a DIY um, sim racing cockpit Facebook group that, I mean, mm. I've seen I've seen people build full motion rigs. They're doing this stuff themselves. Full motion. I mean, going side to side, tilts you forward for brakes, tilts you back for acceleration. They've got fans that are built in, like computer fans that are timed. So when your mm -hmm. speed goes up, the the, the fans <laughs> increase to, to blow more. I think that's a bit over the top, yeah. but I mean. Pretty but um, every I mean, ounce of immersion you can get, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I mean the dedication that's going on there and then I, I would see somebody say, well, you know, you could have a pretty cool real car for the amount of money that you spent on this. You know, <laughs> why are you doing this? And it's like, well, 
you take your real car out to the track and yeah, I mean, it's a different experience. It's, it's exciting, but you know what, if, if you slide and you bump into a wall, now you got to spend more money to repair it. Um, you have to spend more money for tires. You have to spend more money for fuel. Once I build my rig, that's it. Hmm. You know, I just need to upgrade my PC hardware every now and again. So for I mean, sure, it's, right? it's a different, it's a different experience, but it's, uh, I mean, it, it's, I don't even get as serious as you, right? I'm, I'm the console guy. I've, I've got uh, an Xbox One X. Um, I've got my homemade sim racing cockpit that I actually did a story on last year. Um, it's still pretty impressive. I'll, I'll, that I'll is put very impressive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, it still, it still holds up. I, I made some errors in that. I, I, need to, I need to fix it and beef it up some more. But to sit down and just kind of relax um with with um i'm also a big project cars guy project cars 2 was awesome matt you and i reviewed project cars 3 can, <laughs> yeah. can, actually can, can we talk a little bit about project cars 3 were you I, I, quick we're, we're, we're at that 30 minute mark yeah but i know but we, we'll give we you gotta, a couple minutes yeah because it's worth saying we we, we got to do this um project cars 2 is still one of just my go-to's if i want a pretty decent console sim racing experience just because um, the physics are good. I don't think the physics are outstanding, but just the whole process of, of the qualifying sessions, the practice sessions, uh, if you go out and just floor it right off the bat without warming up your tires, you're toast. You know, it just, it has, it has such a comprehensive feel. And then we heard that project cars three is coming and you and I both reviewed the game. And I know we talked about it a little bit. It's been some time. Were you as disappointed as I was? I was very disappointed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, it's just, I, for people that don't know, uh, you know, Project Cars 2, I think, was a fantastic balance between sort of the serious sim racing game and something that's very accessible to people that are new. And that was fantastic because it was sort of a sort of a gateway game to get into, you know, a set of courses and stuff that's more serious. Or you could just enjoy that. But um, Project Cars 3 was it, it took a turn in the mobile direction, I, I think we would say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, it, you know, it did away with uh, it did away with the pit sequences and it was tire wear. I, I mean, tire wear. I mean. All of it. Um, it even took a downgrade, sort of in graphical fidelity, which was a bit weird. But it was just, it was just disappointing in a lot of ways. Well, what's the uh, what's the best game that you've played recently? And by recently, I'll say in the last year or so. Ooh, it's, the easy answer would be uh, Assetto Corsa, Competizione. But um, I don't know. I, I would say um, no. I, I would say that. I mean, I've I've spent probably in the thousands of hours on that game right now, and it was released in 2018. You know, I, I was part of the early beta, and nice. seeing where that game has come from 2018 to now is just incredible. Don't uh, don't play it on console. Stick with PC. I, I actually I, <laughs> I did heard, yes. <laughs> I, I did a review for a, a set of course a competition a for PC um, just as it was coming out, and. I thought it was great on PC, and then I I did the review when they ported it to console, and I, I think my catch line was lost in translation. It uh, there was just there were bugs, the frame rates were terrible. Um, I mean, I, I I wanted to embrace it because it does have all of those stages of realism, but just the the, the graphics, the frame rate. Um, the the steering wheel, the feedback. I don't think they put the same attention to detail um, in the console mm -hmm. that they did for PC. So basically, what I need to do is build me a PC, <laughs> right? So, you so I can yes. get back. <laughs> Bruce, I gotta ask, what the, what car racing game are you playing right now? Dude, I still play Forza Horizon Four. It's not I, a hey, sim. I it, know it, that. It, it's not, but it's <laughs> well. He, see, here's here's another thing. Here's another thing, right? I've encountered it, it and it's kind of ironic because I was talking earlier about the the people that are racing real cars kind of being a little condescending to the sim racers. I've also encountered the sim racers kind oh, of totally. being kind of you know condescending to to you know other people that are just more casual and it's like 
at the end of the day, yeah. it's all about enjoyment. And, and uh, when so that's the thing, I have been the sim racer guy. I was the sim racer guy back in the day. My dad and I used to play Grand Prix Legends together. And that game, at least at the time, now they've kind of people have loved it and patched it and stuff like that, that you could play it online. But I would set a fat la- fast lap. He would set a fast lap. Like that's how that was our version of racing together. Um, and so I've been there and in my modern world, I've got a computer that I use for work, but it doesn't have a good graphics card in it. I, I just can't play the modern sim games, but I can play Forza Horizon 4 on my Xbox One. And so I do. Well, it's, yeah, I think it's an important thing, thing for me to say that, um, you know, I think the whole, the whole PC, uh, you know, Assetto, Corsa, or, you know, people that play serious racing games on PC, I think we, we often get labeled as elitist and, you know, we, we don't have appreciation for people who just want to, you know, have fun on a racing game. But I think that's a beautiful thing about sim racing that, you know, anybody can just jump into the game of their choice and enjoy it. You know, it, it doesn't have to be this, you know, super serious uh, experience. It can be really whatever you, whatever you choose. Yeah, no, I think it's whatever yeah. excites you, but I also understand what I am playing is not a simulation because I have played simulations before and I know Sure, it's yeah, And it, it well, is what it is. It, they can both bring excitement, but I know that, when I drive a, a WRX in Forza Horizon 4, it is not like driving it actually in the dirt or snow or whatever. Right. And, and, I, and, yeah. and let's face it, I don't think any you know hardcore sim racing program game that's, that's detailed to the nth degree is going to come out with a first-gen legacy turbo anytime soon. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I adore... Door that car, and I have mine in Forza Horizon 4 decked out in Colin McRae livery. And I love, love, love sitting down in my <laughs> cockpit. The experience is fantastic. At the end of the day, it's about enjoyment and having fun. And when you can have a nice balance, to me, it's all sim racing because it's simulating the act of racing. Sure. It's that, some are more realistic. Some are more realistic than others, but yeah. And and Matt, I I, I agree with you. I, I think I think there's a lot of negativity that goes towards the the PC guys. And I've I've talked to a lot that are just like, hey, go out and just have fun. And I've and I've talked to a lot of console people that are like, oh, I want nothing to do with you because you have a PC. And it's like, <laughs> dude, just just shut up and race, man. Just shut up and game. Where it's it's all about having fun. I exactly. think that this is a topic we could we could discuss for quite a bit more. Oh, well, we, we will. do, though, yeah. <laughs> have something else we want to discuss today. And uh, so I think we should kind of start transitioning towards that. Um, oh, one come thing, on. Though, well, no, I, <laughs> I, dude, I know I, I could know. take you upstairs. I could talk about video games all night. I've got a game room that I love, but <laughs> we got to keep things flowing. So. Unfortunately, though, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm holding up my copy of Gran Turismo 4, the greatest sure racing are. game that was ever made. Anyways, go ahead. Yes. Um, unfortunately, though, you folks did not really give us any good comments about our topic last week, which was about GM engines and then about quirky GM cars. So listeners, I, I'm I'm disappointed, especially come on, GM people. Yeah, I know. I know you're out there because I'm kind of a Ford guy and you give me crap all the time for it. So we should have had our inbox flooded with GM people saying absolutely saying I, I can't believe seen, like people telling me a Cosworth Vega was the GM I needed to own. Yes, I didn't get that, though. So. I, I I didn't get any of that. I didn't get anybody telling me that the the thirty eight hundred was the best engine ever made. I didn't get no. anybody telling me how could you not mention a four fifty four big block? Come on! I didn't get any Fiero love. Like there was a lot missing last week. So we need to do better, week, people. Though, yeah, we need to do better. So here's what we're gonna do. We already know who our guest is for next week. And Smith, you are gonna introduce that person. And, you know, let's get some questions going. So, please. so, so, 
yeah, so so listeners, whether you're on Spotify, I'll say it all again: Spotify, Google, Apple, YouTube, iTunes, YouTube. Yep, the whole um, shebang. It's, well, especially if, if you're on YouTube and you're into cars, you might know this person. Mm-hmm. Um, his name's John Benson. Uh, he has tire reviews. His channel on YouTube. He's he's one of the most knowledgeable tire guys um, I've ever talked to, and I'm one of those tire nerds. Um, I, I've I've preached many many years about having good snow tires in winter conditions but after talking to john and we've covered quite a few of his videos and uh, they always do uh good for our for our motor one audience and he's an interesting guy so uh, he's he's an interesting guy and he's he's put out some very interesting tests that have even opened my eyes in other areas that i didn't realize and i always thought i was kind of a tired nerd and the, the fact is tires are probably the single most underrated, underappreciated part of a vehicle. It doesn't, nothing else matters if you don't have a good contact with the ground. So nope. next week we're, we're going to, we're actually, we're going to have John on the show. Uh, we're going to talk tires and listeners. If you have anything that you want to know about tires, now is your chance. Send us an email podcast at motor one.com. Give us your questions. We're going to have John for the whole hour. We're going to talk tires. We're going to do some other fun stuff. And yeah, here's your chance. What are those numbers on the sidewall mean? We can, yep. we, we can tell you. We can tell you. Does, do snow tires really make a difference? Well, I, I can tell you right now, yes. Hell yes, they do. Um, but other things to consider like temperature, the compound of the tires, there's so much to talk about. So any questions, now's your chance. Send it. Over to us, podcast at motorone.com. We're going to talk to John next week, and it's going to be a great show. Yeah, please do. But now, with, oh, you, go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I, I was just say now. Okay. It, um, it's time for some fun. It is. It's More time for fun. some fun. Yeah. Um, so we kind of wanted to start thinking about what are the unsung heroes of the automotive world? What are cars that exist out there that don't get the respect that they need? What is the Harvey danger field of cars? And I just said Harvey and I meant Rodney. I'm sorry. (laughs) I was combining nine. Regardless, what is the Rodney danger field of cars? And this is, this is something that. Uh, unsung heroes is going to be a recurring segment. We're going to bring this back every so often exactly, because there are so many out there. And again, if you're listening and you have your own opinions on what an unsung hero is, send them in. We'll talk about them in a future episode. Uh, Right now, Bruce, me, Matt, we've all picked our own unsung heroes. We each have one for this episode. Just like last week, we didn't tell anybody what we're picking, so we don't know. These are all surprises. We we don't know what the other person has, but yeah, the car that doesn't get the respect it deserves. Should we let Matt go first since Matt's the guest here? I think that seems like a right good punishment. Yeah, for being true to that. Do do you want to go first, Matt? Are you ready for this? I'll do it, yeah. Some some unsung hero action. Yeah, some unsung hero action. Oh, I mean, any, any genre, any era. So you'll see here, it's the Ferrari F50. I just thought I'd get a, uh, wow. a video going back in the background <laughs> here. Um, it unsung, can really? Hey, really? <laughs> unsung? Maybe unsung is the wrong word for it, but I think next to the F40, it is probably one of the most hated Ferraris. Well, in comparison to that, um, it was rarer than the F40. Uh, it had a V12. It was sort of the original version of the AMG Project One, which is sort of like a you know an everyday Formula One car. Um, you know, it, there was there was a lot of people, especially Jeremy Clarkson, who had big hate for it. Um, he actually did yeah, a but test he's, next he's to kind of a mini. Well, yeah. Aside from that, <laughs> I just think it gets a lot of hate, but it's a really awesome car and. I just, that's all I got, (laughs) but okay. So in all fairness here, what do you think your, our, your odds of are driving an F 50 in your lifetime? Oh, it's very slim. (laughs) (laughs) It, it, to me, any car that costs that much can't be unsung. That, that, That is just purely my opinion. Um, 
that when you are in that lofty of air that, you know, that the handful of rich guys that are going to be able to own one, that that doesn't, it's hard to call that unsung because it's a Ferrari. Is there, okay, maybe a 412i, like there are a handful of unsung Ferraris, but I can't anything with an F in front of its name. It's just hard for me to agree with you. No, I, I, I think I get where you're a misread, but (laughs) I, I think I, no, 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 I'm not trying. No, it's just a disagreement. It's not that it in the Ferrari world, you're right that it is unsung. It's just that it's not the way I thought of this question. Put it that way. Sure. Okay. In, in context, uh, that maybe that's a good way to put it, Bruce in context in the Ferrari world. Maybe it is unsung. I, uh, I understand the some of the hate for it. The, that I, I, it was Clarkson, I think, that said uh, it wants to be an F one car, but it's not. And well, of course, it's not. You stupid! It's it's a road. <laughs> yeah, car I, don't, I don't necessarily with two agree seats. with a lot it's, of what he's saying. To be honest, it's you know, it's it's just you know, just just you know, ridiculous. I love the F fifty. Mm-hmm. I love the sound it makes. I love the way it looks. Working against it, I mean, you're following the F forty. And yeah, could, that's the could, problem. Could any car live up to that? I mean, I mean, anything from Ferrari. Uh, I mean, I've heard people dump on the Enzo for the way it looks. I've heard people dump on the F50 for just how harsh and ridiculous it feels to drive. And it's just like, I mean, can it? Can anybody follow the F40? I, I think both of those cars, the Enzo, the F50, I think they're great. You know? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think part of the, you know, Formula One car for the road bit where the engine was a stressed member of the chassis in the F50, you know, obviously it, it made it extremely uncomfortable. But for what you're saying from a looks perspective, you know, I, exactly. How do you compete with the F the F40? So, I mean, I'll give you that a little bit. I'll, I'll give you that a little bit. <laughs> Bruce? Why don't, why don't you jump in here? Because I don't, okay. I don't want to follow. I don't want to follow my choice with the F50. <laughs> no, we're, we're sticking so, this one to you. Know, I, I knew that would be controversial, <laughs> especially when you see my choice. F- yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I might be on the same boat here. I'm curious <laughs> how many F50s you could buy for the price of the car that I'm about to show you. Uh-oh. <laughs> so. Oh, we're, I hope this is the front end and not the rear end. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. The Saab 900 SPG. Oh. Can you just leave that picture up for a while? I've got <laughs> others. I'm going to share others. Don't worry. So introduced originally in 85. And at that point, it was kind of just a dressed up 900 turbo. When it really got special is 87. It got a better suspension. It got a better version of what um, Saab called the APC, the uh, advanced performance controller, something performance controller. And that gave it a little bit more power. And then in 90, it got a better turbo as well. So what's an F50 make? It's over 500 horse, right? In the ballpark, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the sub I'm talking about is a buck seventy five. So, <laughs> so not quite in this. Or that's the last one. The earliest one is like one sixty with the just the standard nine hundred turbo motor. Um, but once they kind of did all the work to them later on at one seventy five. Um, but yeah, like so. And I have to preface this: the first car I ever owned was an '85 Saab 900, and it was the most base base version. It had uh, the the eight valve engine, no turbo, and an automatic transmission. So the slowest version of that car that you could possibly imagine. On the other end of that spectrum is the SPG, which is 16 valve engine, turbocharged. Um, and like I said, 85, 160, they kind of, they kept tweaking it and tweaking it. And by within a few years, you're making a buck 75. And I love, I love that car. And not it's, many people know about them. And they're still vaguely like their store. They're still normal guy affordable. Like on our salaries, we could afford that car. They're, oh, there's nothing. Oh yeah. 
Um, I've been I've been close to buying a, a, a classic 900 like that on more than one occasion. Is there a car that rocks? We just got to say this for those that aren't watching on YouTube. Is there a car that better rocks the tri spoke wheels than a Saab 900? I don't think there is. So I don't I, I don't think there is, especially that in white with a matching and, white tri spokes. Look at that. And I agree with you. Unfortunately, that's the prototype version in. In, in the production versions were only black, red, and like a charcoalish gray. Um, they never made the white. Oh, yeah, they never made the white in a production version, unfortunately. But so that's a prototype. But it's just such a good. It to Matt, I assume you're disagreeing with me. But to no, me, I'm not. Like, that is <laughs> me as a teenager. That was my first car when I was 16, but that was the hottest version of it. Like that's the kid with a charger with the inline six looking at the kid with a charger <laughs> with a Hemi and being like, I want to be that guy because that's exactly what it is. But but your base sob still had the ignition in the center console, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I, I love sobs just for that, just for that alone. The nine, the nine hundreds. I mean, that looks good. I think the convertible looks so much better. So yeah. So there's the engine. It is front wheel drive, but you'll notice that the engine is longitudinally mounted. I don't know why. Like by that time, everyone had just gone to a transversely mounted engine for a front wheel drive car, but Saab yeah, it, decided to be Saab, and they're like, no, no, it was, no. It was Saab. I mean, didn't didn't something run through like the oil pan, like part of the running gear? On those I'm cars, not sure but, about like, that, but I know like if that you the wanted, like the clutch belt, was in front. So the timing belt, and I don't know if you can see my mouse here, is in the back. Yeah. So, like, if you ever want to change the timing belt, basically, <laughs> just pull the good engine. on you. Like, just, just pull the engine. Yeah, just pull the engine because the timing belt is in the back rather than the front, where you would expect everything is backwards with a sob. It's just the way to understand things. But that, but that's one of the reasons to love it. Yeah, hold on. I've got one last image of it, and this is the front three quarter view of an SPG. And I ha actually, I have to thank Bring a Trailer for these images because finding vintage top end sob images are just hell. <laughs> um, I, th I, th I think that kind of speaks for sob. So yeah, so you've I'm got your three say. spoke wheels. You've got your body cladding down the side. So this, like, this is a part that I bought as a kid. the The vent cover at the back that was like a turbo SPG thing. Like, that's what the cool sobs had. The regular <laughs> ones had a full on vent back here. Yeah, like, I, I would if the right if one came up today for like six seven grand, I would buy it just in an instant. You know, oh, especially. Crap. Especially in SPG. Did they oh, make no, the totally. SPG? Did they make the SPG in a convertible? No. I want to say it was that coupe only. They, they they didn't. Okay. Yeah. It was uh, coupe yeah, only. Yeah, because I've I've seen I, I love convertibles. And I think that I mean that the Saab looks neat as a coupe. I think it looks better as a convertible. Um I is it is it unsung though? I mean, do you do you really think it's unsung? I mean or, or, or is it just how many just people more? do you hear? like evangelizing the Saab 900 and then how many of those are evangelizing the top end version. I feel like it's a, you know, I, it's I mean, a percentage I, I, of a percentage. I, I, I guess I feel like it's a car that's known and appreciated. Oh God, this is going to make me sound terrible. I, I apologize, everybody. I feel like it's a car that's known and appreciated by people that matter. <laughs> okay. If, 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 if you catch my meaning there a little bit, maybe, I mean, non-car people don't get it don't get it but but they're not going to get it they're not going to get anything you know like that car related but there I, are I, I, like a non-car person's going to look at a corvette and say oh that guy's driving a corvette a non-car person is going to look at someone in a porsche and say oh that person is driving an old porsche if someone if i roll up in a 90 Saab 900 spg the amount of people that are going to get it is such a it's such a sliver of the car loving group that I still think it is unappreciated. I think, but on the other hand, with their, with Saab's advertisements and television and all that, they were some of the most sort of out of there, like bombastic and creative 
advertisements. So for, for yeah. non-car people, I think if they saw those, they would be like, wow, that's a sob. But I think car people like us, we sort of get what's behind that. Mm-hmm. So I think the other, okay. I, I think it's a, okay. a double, it's a double thing. Also, my mom had a Saab 9.3 and that was her favorite car until she couldn't get parts for it anymore. But I got to drive it on a handful of occasions and it was it was not the best driver's car ever, but it was the best highway car I've ever driven. Cause like, if you just wanted to pass someone, you, it was super smooth. And then you press down on the throttle, the turbo spooled up and you pass the semi and it was not, there was no drama. There was no nothing. It was smooth as hell. It was fantastic. So I, I, I like sobs basically is what I'm saying. No, Hey, I- I'm with you. I mean, maybe a case could be made that all sobs are unsung heroes. Twist. Maybe. 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 Smith, maybe. it's your turn, though. <laughs> so you've got Ferrari F50 and Saab 900 SPG. You have a huge gamut at this point. You could be anywhere. Are you ready to go there? I'm are ready. You, are, are you really ready to go there? <laughs> oh, I'm ready. Not only do I think this is a tremendous unsung hero, I have a personal stake in this because I wrote a buyer's guide for this car. Is it a show? No. Okay. It's a it Mustang is, 2. It is the Ford oh, Mustang, Mustang 2. Okay. Two. <laughs> the Mustang that everybody hates. The Mustang that is cliched among journalists and bloggers who fancy themselves knowledgeable about cars, but yet have never driven a Mustang 2. Guess what? I have. They aren't that bad. Not only that, your modern Mustangs, your Shelbys, everything after this car exists because of that car. You know why? The rear, the For, rear Ford end. sold Ford sold like a million of those cars. So I recently Ford. found out that when my uncle met my aunt, she was driving a Mustang too. They're they're neat cars, but what people have done for far too long is they've taken this car out of context. And I will freely admit that I was among those people for many years early on. Oh, it's just a, oh, it's just a Pinto. The, some parts are shared with a Pinto, but it's vastly Mustang. And the, the biggest thing here, you have to think back in context, the 1970s, you have um, the, the fuel crisis, you, you have emissions coming in, tastes were changing, people's needs were changing. Yes, it was a neutered muscle car. I think the highest output Mustang II was 140 or 150 horsepower. I'm not entirely sure on the number. But you cannot fault Ford for building a car that people wanted. And when you sell a million of them, <laughs> if you sell a million cars, you're catering to an audience. Sure. Be- because that car sold as well as it did, it encouraged Ford to keep the Mustang going instead of dropping it altogether. Like they almost did in the eighties with the probe. So <sighs> once I, once I step off my, uh, my big high horse here, Stop hating the Mustang two people go out and drive one before you talk about how terrible it is. They, they are underpowered. Everything back then is underpowered, but I tell you what, it's got the three Oh two V eight. I mean, you could get them with a six cylinder. Don't get, don't get the six cylinder. It's, I mean, you can step up. I mean, the car that I'm showing right here on YouTube, this was actually a car that I almost bought and I took pictures and I wrote up the article for motor one. Here's the Mustang two buyers guy that you never thought you'd need. This particular one, it, it, uh, it, it had some minor rust issues. It was advertised as rust-free, but when you looked up under the doors, I've got the pictures up here now. I mean, you could see some rust coming up underneath. This car was selling, I think, for $3,000, and maybe, maybe I could have bought it for less. And, I mean, it certainly didn't look bad, but you can get a V8 Mustang II for very, very little money and it's got the 302 v8 in there you can snap your fingers and make 300 horsepower out of that engine with very very minor investments just uh in i mean you swap out the heads and the intake 
and you know give it a, a free or flowing exhaust, your 300 horsepower. A car that small with 300 horsepower is just a rip to drive. And it has such a small wheelbase. It, it just, it feels like it just kind of wraps around you. The really, I guess the only other Mustang that I could compare it to might be like a, like, like a, an, an eighties Fox body notchback that, that just kind of has that small feel to it. But that with the hatch, I mean, you get one of those, you tweak up the engine a little bit, you stiffen the suspension a little bit. That thing is an autocross hero. And, and I love the seventies louvers, just the big graphics, the ridiculousness of it all. Absolutely an unsung hero. And especially if you listening right now are a Mustang fan, but hate Mustang twos, you need to appreciate them because the Mustang two is the reason you have, or may be able to buy a new Mustang today. Change my mind. <laughs> so here's the thing. I can't. Like I was trying to look up, I think you're right. I think it's 140 horsepower. My only issue is, is that if you put that up against the other muscle cars of the 70s, the Camaro, the second gen Camaro, second gen F- Firebird. The ones that sold up in much lower numbers, you mean? Yeah, no, I I am saying from an aesthetic st- standpoint, I would take one of those. I, but I mean, at that point, the Challenger was a rebadged Mitsubishi or was about to be. So, you know, the 70s were a rough time. And like I said, you know, my aunt owned one. It, the 70s were a rough time. And if you were in that time, that was about the best you could do. But, and, the, but the thing is, you have to remember in context. Back then. That's what I'm the, saying. In context, the, the, it was the good. Best, like, I just the, the don't best, love it. But, but the best wasn't a big power monger. The best was something yeah. small and sporty that was better on gas, even though on, it really wasn't better on gas. It, but it I mean, that's just, where the it was, it was better on emissions comes from as well. Right. That, like, you know, they were trying to figure out how do you make power from less displacement? And yeah, no, mm-hmm. I, I can't fight you on this one. It of, if you look at it within the context of its time, it's a good car. It's not a car that me personally, I'm ever going to like, but I also can't tell you you're wrong. That's where I am. We're, we're browsing through some of the pictures here right now. I mean, yeah, the, the car that I have pictured here, I drove, like I said, I decided not to buy it. Um, I don't have a lot of space. Um, I already had a Mustang at that point. Actually, I, I still I, do. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Mustang that I still have. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I, I get so, so tired of hearing people just, hate on the Mustang too, because it was underpowered. Everything was in the seventies. Everything was underpowered. Well, it, it's, it's, it's a Pinto. There, there were some parts shared, but I think it's like, I think it's like 80% of the parts were, were Mustang. And they, they say these things just because, oh, it's, it's the, the neat thing to say. And I can say this because I used to be that way until I met uh, a, a friend of mine that still works over uh, with a Ford performance group who just loved Mustang twos. He also loves Pintos. So, Hey, I have a thing for loving the cars that most people hate just because you know what? Somebody needs to love them, but every I now and again, I was the Corvair last week to be clear. <laughs> like I'm not, and I'm in that group too. So once, once I got to know and understand that car better, you know what? It, it matters. To place it in context that changes that changes the whole story matt you've been really quiet that makes me a little nervous <laughs> well I, no i was just gonna say it, it's you know coming from me about that vehicle i just I, it gets compared to the toyota celica a lot does it not i mean because it yeah. was it wasn't as fuel efficient wasn't i i don't know if it wasn't as powerful necessarily but i think over in japan you know it's like the celica was just this beast of a package it was, you know, it was fuel efficient. It handled really well. It was, you know, it might sting a little bit, but it was reliable. And no, um, no, you're, I think you're not wrong. <laughs> with all of those things, you know, as you say, the Mustang too, it was just sort of, uh, you know, beaten into submission for not really any good reason. I mean, well, I think <laughs> once you start bringing up, this is the period when Japan really started competing. You mentioned the Celica. The one that comes to my mind are the 260, 280 Zs. Mm-hmm. 
that are, you know, they don't have that V8 power, but their inline sixes are kind of simple, you know, of similar range. Yes, similar mm-hmm. performance but, and, and superior cars all around. I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. But here, no, but no, here's the thing coming from a modern standpoint, find a Celica or a Datsun 240, 240, 60, 80 Z for the price that you can get a Mustang two. I've looked at them in my area. Mustang twos are less than 10 grand all day. Every day doesn't in, matter. In like, in like almost mint condition. Right. I, Whereas I mean, the there's that other cars, at, three grand, three yeah. grand. It, it's an interesting position at, uh, as time has gone on that you know the mustang 2 has not appreciated appreciated whereas those japanese models have Mm -hmm. i I think those engines that you know people always say you know it's like oh it's underpowered underpowered this underpowered that but i think it's a lot more about the driving experience you know it's it's something that's Mm -hmm. underpowered like that you just drive it at 10 tenths and you drive the hell out of it you know you would have so much more fun in something like that than you know say I don't know, just as an example, a a more modern car with more power. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I can I can actually give you an apples to apples on that, because right now I have a 95 Mustang GT convertible. It's the last year, the five liter. They were officially rated at just 215 horsepower, like has in two one five. It's believed that they were a little underrated. I've done a little bit of work on mine. It's making about 250 at the crank. It's it's still I mean, I mean, a new Four cylinder Mustang has more power than that. Now, prior to that Mustang, I had an 03 SVT Cobra with the Terminator V8 supercharged. That was modified. That was making about 500. I do miss the power. I do miss the power of the Terminator, but I I still enjoy the hell out of driving the old 50 with the uh, with the 250 horse. It's got gobs of torque. It it still has enough power to be fast and to get you into trouble, mm-hmm. and and you know what, uh, the Terminator was like twenty grand, and uh, th- this Mustang was like thirty five hundred. <laughs> so did I, I mean, also hear correctly yeah. that you've driven your your Mustang in the snow, the uh, the newer one? Several well, we times. Were t- <laughs> we were we were talking earlier about snow. I'll be good tires. for that. <laughs> um, yes, I I don't drive it that much because I I work from home. Um, and I'm not keen to go out and get it full of salt, um, but sure. yeah. we, we recently got uh, you know some snowfall here in western South Dakota, and they're pretty light on the salt out here, especially in some of the uh, just in some of the the smaller neighborhood roads. So yeah, um, on what was it Saturday? I think I just took it out for a fun drive around the neighborhood with my snow tires on. It's ridiculous how good that car goes. We're, we'll talk. We'll talk about that stuff next week. Oh, wait, wait, um, one real quick. Okay. Don't you dress up as Santa Claus though and go out on <laughs> Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> what? Where did you people hear that? Is there a secret camera in my house? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> For the last several years, um, because of the, my family, my wife's family, they're all still pretty much backy. So come Christmas Eve. There are all kinds of houses around Rapid City here that like to decorate. And I enjoy the car. I enjoy the convertible. It's red. Okay. I've got a good set of snow tires on it. I'm not afraid to drive it up hills. I'll drive it through a foot of snow. I've got a little bit of weight in the trunk. And with the good snow tires, it'll actually go through it. I mean, that's that's how big of a difference snow tires make. So come Christmas Eve. We bundle up. We put the top down, no matter what the temperature is. I've done this when it was snowing. <laughs> And um, I've got my Santa beard and I put on my Santa hat and we go out and we tour the, the lights around Rapid City and, uh, you know, we'll Facebook live it or something so our families can see it. And, yeah, it's become kind of a traditional thing. Good. <laughs> and we can and we can talk all about tires next week. Yeah, um, I've I've done a lot with tires. John's done just a heck of a lot more. And I'm really excited to uh, to get to chat with him to see just just how just how shocking it can be when you have a good set of tires on a car, not just for winter, but in wet in dry and different applications. It's like I said, it's opened my eyes. So there's a little preview for next week. Sure. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening this week as always. Good afternoon. Good evening. And good night, Matt. Thanks for joining us. 
Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Do you have any like fun. social media, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, I don't know, whatever. Do you post <laughs> on social media somewhere that you would like to uh, talk about? Uh, not really, honestly. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, get, not- us, get us at motorone.com. Yep. Um, you know, this, <laughs> Gotta get that this, plug. This will be posted. Motor One. This will, <laughs> well, not this only will that, posted but- up on Friday. But not only that, but podcast at motorone.com. Please yep. email us. Send us questions for John next week because he he wants to answer your questions. This is a tire expert. And you know, he's ready to answer whatever that you want to know. So please let us know. Power means nothing if you can't put it to the ground. And you know, Bruce, this is something we haven't done, but you and I are also on Twitter. So if you want to if if you want to talk with us on Twitter, you can catch me at CH Writing C. H writing Bruce, what's your uh, what's what's your oh, it's easy? Say. Uh it's Chris C H R I S Bruce B R U C E 1985 1985. So. There you go. Catch us on Twitter, post your comments, email us podcast motor1.com. Bruce, take us out, man. All right. Thanks a lot, folks. We'll talk to you next week. Bye bye.